What's the word, y'all? I cannot believe I'm filming this video. And I'm smiling because my team is living to see another day. I'm going to be honest with you. In the first quarter, I completely accepted the fact that the season was over. I watched this team for 82 games, and I've seen them go down by big in the first half and not have a lot of fight to come back and win a game. They did it today. Oh, boy, they did it today. And we're looking forward to Miami on Friday. But the only problem with that is our best player's not coming to Miami with us, man. DeMar DeRozan's daughter has to go back to school. And she was one of the main reasons why we won tonight, man. So I'm, I'm a little bit scared. Because I, I, we need that screaming in the background. Now, for real, overall, it was just a very weird experience because we all were watching this game and we heard the screams in the background, but nobody knew exactly where it was coming from. It, it reminded me of, and if you watched baseball during the WBC, it reminded me of the first game of the WBC. There was this guy, and I think he was representing Cuba, where he was in the back with a blow horn for the entire game. And all the Twitter was like, somebody kick that man out. And that's what it felt like until we found out that it was DeMar DeRozan's daughter. And they're like, there's a literal 0% chance to get kicked out of the game. DeMar DeRozan's the all-time leading scorer in franchise history. Uh -uh. Nah. People say, oh, she was a civilian. Then maybe she... It don't matter. First of all, no. I don't think you would because it's a, it's a sporting event. People are yelling and screaming all the time. But because it's against your team, you think that that person has been kicked out? It, either way, she was very, very critical in today's win. And Pascal Siakam came to the podium afterwards and he mentioned that he didn't even recognize that that was going on. And that's probably some truth. I'm assuming that because there's so much going on within the game that these players don't even think about the outside noise. But whether they heard it or not, they shot 50% from the free throw line and they should have won this game. This is an epic collapse for the Toronto Raptors. There's no way around it. They were up by 19 points. If you're just looking at the box score without looking at the final score, this is a game that you win. And I'll explain why. Now, neither of these two teams are good three-point shooting teams. That's a fact. Um, but in this game, the Toronto Raptors made four more threes on better efficiency. Again, they attempted 14, 14 more free throws. They got eight more offensive boards, 14 more boards in general. They won the assist battle, and they lost by four points. Usually, this big of discrepancy on the free throw shooting and on the glass is enough to tell you what team won if you can't look at the final score. But they melted down. They did. Zach Levine in the third quarter turned into to Michael Jeffrey. And I'm, I'm just feeling good because I didn't have a lot of hope. It's a funny thing because the play-in is basically two fan bases that have been put through the ringer. Well, I've watched all 82 games of the Bulls this season. Toronto Raptors fans have watched all 82 games of their favorite team. They're telling me that the Bulls are going to win because their team is trash. I'm telling them that the Raptors are going to win because our teams are trash. And it's just two fan bases that are like done with their favorite team but still rooting for them. Going against each other. And the reason why I wasn't very optimistic about my team is not just because, again, I've watched them 82 times and I've seen that in a lot of cases they don't come out with a lot of fight. Um, DeMar DeRozan has struggled uh, against the Raptors all season long. In some of those games, um, Zach Levine didn't play at all. And I think that mattered. You know, Zach Levine, of course, again, almost at 40 tonight. Um, but DeMar DeRozan had struggled. And in the games that we played against them, they had the size and the rebounding to win majority of those games. And again, they did that today. They beat us on the offensive glass. They, they beat us on the defensive glass. And I just thought with the length and the athleticism across the board that they were going to win this. And in the first quarter, this is, this is how it is to be a Bulls fan. And I'm sure some of y'all can relate with y'all favorite teams. Where like you watch the first half or the first quarter about your team. And because it's not going good, you kind of detach yourself from the results. You know what I'm saying? I was already thinking about, okay, what does offseason look like for us, man? Because let's be real. I, I was making videos about the Bulls making trades this February. They made no trades whatsoever. So I'm thinking about this offseason like, okay, uh, how can we make some money here? Do we trade this player there? And then in the second half, again, Zach Levine really turned it up. And I was happy to see, even though Patrick Williams ended with only 10 points and 33% shooting, I think he was critical today. And, and again, the shots were not falling, but the defense was there. And I, th I feel like this was a better, this is so stupid to say because he made, ended, ended with 10 points or 33% shooting. But his feel in this game felt very and I mean very, very impactful. Me and the guys um, on our podcast put together our All-NBA and you know all the awards or whatever. And I think all of us at Alex Caruso on the first team, I remember looking through some comments and they're like, what are y'all talking about? Alex Caruso, first team. If you watch this game, you recognize all of that. Yeah, it's gonna, it's, he's always going to get a couple fouls and you're like, come on, Alex. But like for the most part, he was all over the place. And that's saying something because in the very early in this game, Pascal Siakam was giving him the work. The Bulls are a small team. I mean, they started DeMar DeRozan and he's the four, but like they're a small team. DeMar DeRozan was, is a shooting guard in most cases, but the way the NBA is going, he can slide over to the forward in the cages. Alex Caruso had the Pascal Siakam assignment, and Pascal was giving that man the work. But eventually, we figured it out. 
And that's not something Billy has done notoriously, you know, making adjustments at halftime and the, and the team having the fight. And maybe it is that the back is against the wall. If we do not win this game, then we do not play another game until October next year or uh, October in a couple months. I'm, I'm just happy that we won. Now, what happens on Friday against Miami? I don't know. But even if we win that one, what happens against the Bucks? We know what's going to happen. Um, but it, it's cool to root for your favorite team, even, even if you know that the out, outcome is going to be losing. You know, we know at 90% of us, 95% of us are going to walk out this season with an L on our record at the end. It's going to end in an L. Most, some, some of y'all already got that. Um, but it's, it's about the times you have. And I was really, really having a lot of fun down the stretch um, in this game. So uh, shout out to DeMar DeRozan and his family for, for coming out and, and helping us win. And Friday, Friday, Friday should be fun, bro. Friday should be fun. And Jimmy Butler always try to get his little revenge against Chicago after they trade him away. Um, and they don't look good either. So it's about to be another battle of two fan bases looking at each other saying, our team sucks. Y'all got this. No, our team sucks. Y'all got this. And we'll see what team ultimately ends up winning. I would say so far, the playing has been an absolute success. Every single one of these games has been down to the wire. Some of them, of course, way uglier than others. But we got OKC versus the Pelicans. And yeah, we could spend a lot of time talking about the Toronto Raptors and what their offseason looks like, considering it feels like there's a ceiling on where they are right now. Or we can't talk about the Pelicans and Zion and, and all of this stuff now that their season is over. But we'll, we'll say those for another video. I would rather just talk about this individual game before getting into offseason stuff and team building and things like that. Um, of course, another back and forth game, back and forth game. The Pelicans had a lot of momentum when they decided to finally give Jonas Valanciunas the ball, but unfortunately he gets injured. Like he gets injured and they have to sit him for the majority of the rest of the fourth quarter and they finally put it back in the game and immediately he gets one more bucket. I mean, ended up with 18 rebounds. And I just keep thinking to myself, if the Thunder win against the Timberwolves, I'm not rooting for anybody, but I, I, I do want to say... My enjoyment factor when watching the, the, the Thunder is up here, and with the Wolves, it's like down here. I'll be honest with you. Who would I rather see in the playoff series versus the Nuggets? I have an, I have an idea as far as the enjoyment factor. But again, I see Big Val end up with 16 and 18. I'm like, what is Jokic going to do to this team if they see each other? At, at, least, at least the Timberwolves have some big bodies to throw at Jokic, even if some of them aren't great defenders or some of them aren't as great of defenders as they used to be. I'm already looking too far ahead. Let, let, let's stick to this series or this game. I don't, I don't want to put it on one person because obviously no one person loses a basketball game. I, down the stretch in the last two games, um, whether it been the last game of the regular season against the Timberwolves to put the Pelicans in this spot, in this game, down the stretch, CJ McCollum has been, had been pretty dreadful in these last um, t Tough, tough floater down the stretch, heavily contested. It's one of those shots that if it goes in, you don't care that it was a bad shot. But since it missed, it's like, why did we do this? Why did we not get a better opportunity? Especially be because Brandon Ingram was starting to find things. Um, once he fouled on that last shot when Lou Dora was contesting, I don't know, the last two-minute report will probably tell you a little something deeper than what I can know. But it felt like down the stretch, CJ wasn't as impactful or as good as we know he normally can be. Again, we've seen him in these high-leverage games before, Game 7 versus the Denver Nuggets a few years ago when he was the best player on the court on court that had Damian Lillard and Nikola Jokic on it. You know what I'm saying? But then these last two games were the most important games of the entire season and down the stretch, he just didn't, didn't look good. And was it him slipping or was it the Herb uh, pass? I don't, I don't really know, but overall, uh, it's a very anticlimactic in, in ending to this back and forth game where it ends in that turnover off the inbound. I mean, the previous play where it's a full court heave to Brandon Ingram and he catches and shoots. I mean, that's stuff that coaches dream about when they throw in the full court heaves. You know what I'm saying? And to have another opportunity to go tie it up or win the game and they go out of bounds. I'm like, again, I'm neutral in here, but I want to see more craziness. I'm like, oh, no. Again, um, probably the second best story of the season only behind the Sacramento Kings being damn good is this is this Thunder team, man. Um, I had always said the youngest team involved, but I forgot that Eric Gordon got traded away from the Houston Rockets. So the Houston Rockets at the end of the season technically had the youngest team in basketball, but the OKC Thunder are there as well. Um, and here they are one game away from having a playoff berth. Again, this is going to be a tough game, I think, um, just like this one was. But to, for Shea to have the lowest amount of first half points of the season and still end up with this occasional 31 and some time. Bro, in that third quarter, there was tough bucket after tough bucket after tough bucket. I'm like, man, there's no way he could keep going. And then within the last 30 seconds of the game, he has this leaner 
going away from the basket to basically, like, ridiculous, bro. Seven points in the first quarter. You know, the defense was there on, on both sides. You know what I'm saying? Lou Dort, again, yeah, 20 in the first half. I ain't even mentioned his name, so my fault, Lou. 20 in the first half, good defense around the way. And then Herb Jones, like, this was a battle that was, for me, as a nerd and a, a defensive guy to see Lou Dort and to see her both have crazy assignments. This was something I was looking forward to. And neither of them disappointed, at least on the defensive side. But offense, great offense is going to win. So eventually, Brandon Ingram got it going. And eventually, Shea Gibbs Alexander got it going. And it's like, like in a lot of these cases, Lou and Herb are playing good D. But, but the offense is just going to do it. So he ends up having his game and hitting the big shots. But like, giddy, man. Giddy. On our pod a little while ago, we were trying to redraft that draft. And I, I was making a case for Giddy to go even higher than where he was drafted in real life. Because even though he doesn't do this on a nightly basis, obviously, if he was averaging a 30-point triple double, <laughs> we've been talking about Josh Giddy a lot more. But this is the type of performances I think he can have more regularly throughout the course of his career. And, and I really enjoy him watching him because he's at his own pace. And there, there, are, there are few people in the NBA that can get it done at the speed that he does. Right? You, you have people like James Harden where if he's in gear one, he's hard to stop. If he's in gear two, he's hard to stop. But if he's in gear three, he's super hard to stop. This man, Giddy, has one gear. And if he can, he can refine on that gear and make it perfect, I'm just I'm just saying it's not going to be many people that can stop it. He got to the basket a lot this game. Of course, the pass is always going to be there. I mean, that's just something he's been doing. That's one of the main reasons he got drafted that high. But he just feels he's just getting better and better and better with time. And though our boy J-Dub didn't have a great game, he had one bucket in this one. It might have been early fourth quarter. A like a, a, a screen came. He split the double team on the screen with a little, like, threw the ball in front of him. Went between the screen to get it, and then with a tough lay on the left, like, come on, bro. Basket, tough basket after tough basket. And he was hooping in D-Rose once. Oh, classics. I had a pair of those in high school. Classics. Now, if you got a, if you got a wider foot, they're going to hurt you a little bit. But if you got a narrow foot, classics, bro. And he had them in a yellow colorway. This was a great game, bro. I'm a little bit afraid about the next playing games because I don't think they're going to live up to this level of intensity and this level of greatness. But if they do, again, Adam, Adam Silver, bro. Adam Silver did it again because the play-in has a, a, every season had given us a few good games. Every game that had nothing to do with the Charlotte Hornets has been a good game in the play-in. Um, and it's continued to be the case. So let me know what you think about these games. Who do you got? OKC versus Minnesota, Chicago versus Miami. And uh, yeah, maybe tomorrow we'll talk about the future of some of these teams that got eliminated.